again, I can introduce um, two really veteran troopers, Sergey and Big Easy, um, that will give us a talk about adventures in SCADA system. I think SCADA systems got a lot of attention um, in the last year, uh, think Stuxnet. Um, so I think they have some very interesting stuff to tell. And I heard some rumor, that, um, the talk also has something to do with cheese. <laughs> we have cheese. Yeah. I, I deny it. <laughs> I deny it. She's not, it's not, it's not on the phone. No, no. All right. Um, so um, I'm Sergey Bratis. Uh, I'm a research assistant professor at Dartmouth College. And before we plunged into SCADA, uh, I would like to. Uh, what about me? Oh, a bit, a bit. yeah, you have to. I, Sergey. I, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I was going to talk about the Dartmouth site, then introduce you. Oh, well, um, I'm sorry. Well, all right. Go, well, then go but, ahead. Uh, absolutely, no, no, absolutely. You but like you're going to be associated with cheese, that's right. Uh, 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 Big Easy, uh, who is the reason, uh, Edmund Rogers, who is the reason why we were actually, I was actually able to get this wonderful adventure in SCADA. Uh, Big Easy worked uh, for a Fortune 500 utility company, uh, protecting a control network, uh, keeping the lights on in... Uh, N states, where N is uh, <coughs> greater than zero and less than 50. All right, you know. <laughs> so you can imagine. So before we start on the SCADA angle, I would like as a public announcement uh, and to uh, you know, show some value uh, in uh, academia, <laughs> so to say, uh, I would like to talk about two projects that we have at Dartmouth. Wait, we didn't discuss this when we were going over the slides an hour and a half ago. Indeed, but it has nothing to do with cheese or oh, SCADA. Okay. So uh, one is Crawdad. This is our repository of wireless data. If you want to be immortalized, or your, rather your data set uh, to be immortalized, give it to us. Uh, we are proud to host the Next Hope uh, New York Hacker Conference uh, badge uh, data and many other interesting pieces of data. Uh, that's one project. Uh, the other is the project that Anna mentioned uh, during the keynote. Uh, we're looking to talk to CISOs uh, to determine how they bridge the gap between the technological underpinnings uh, that systems can enforce uh, in terms of policy, attestation, trusted computing, anything that uh, Intel and other vendors are throwing at the security wall, and uh, how this is meeting or not meeting your needs as a CISO. And with that, we're coming back to adventures on SCADA. So we have a varied set of interests, which is what uh, found me going to a SCADA place. Uh, in most SCADA talks, you actually see images like that. Uh, and they're there for the show. We actually, I actually got to see that kind of a board. Um, so. Um, uh, to lead in, and now I have to uh, totally disappoint you. Uh, this talk is not going to release any zero days. Uh, we're not going to name any vendors. In fact, this guy is going to... Uh, I'm here to ensure that. Yeah, basically jump on me if I do. <laughs> and uh, there is going to be uh, no Stuxnet. <laughs> no Stuxnet whatsoever. I mean, Stuxnet is uh, a load of fun, you know, and made this guy very unhappy. He probably doesn't approve that we're not talking about it. But, um, you know, we're not playing, uh, we're not, and there, is a, there should be a Stuxnet bingo. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in Stuxnet, there are two great talks uh, in the CCC uh, 27C3 uh, this December. Um, chase them down, uh, they're uh, very informative. Uh, it was a revelation uh, to me. So we're not going to talk, about, to talk about Stuxnet, but we are going to talk about uh, SCADA in the wild. And most uh, great talks in SCADA vulnerabilities, which actually released zero days, unlike you know, I'm not going to do today, uh, were researchers taking open source SCADA setting up uh, some sort of an artificial test bed in which they could talk to it, and then exploiting it. Uh, what we got to do is, was completely different. 
First of all, we wanted to see the really expensive pieces of equipment that are working at an actual utility. Secondly, so secondly, we wanted to go there and see what the control network looked like on the inside and mm -hmm. uh, what that um, environment looked operation looked like operationally. And besides, it's cruel to take uh, something from a SCADA piece of software from the wild and bring it to the lab and they don't breed as well. Uh, and it's just, well, uh, you know. So it's, it's, it's better to go to the jungle than build your zoo, possibly, maybe. Um, we did to do some fuzzing. We're, I mean, we're going to talk about that. Uh, the interesting point about fuzzing with really expensive, and we're talking uh, 100K, uh, to possibly a million dollars, is that you can't instrument those things. <laughs> no way. And the vendors are not going to give you the spec. Uh, and the bonuses uh, included uh, going through this uh, a kind of a man trap. Anal you, probe? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Sergey doesn't no, like to talk about no that. No freaking way. Uh, anyhow, uh, no, it was no, easier getting through the airport. Uh, no peeing in the cup either, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, as you know, uh, for many uh, jobs um, and access to facilities, uh, people need to do drug testing. So, no, that was not one of those. Uh, and, the, and the biggest thing was Sergey had to get up and be ready to go by God, seven a.m. God, scare the people, right? They're up at six, at work at seven. If you want to play ball with them, uh, you have to be up at six and in at seven. This is horrible. Um, fuzzing across state lines. Uh, we're going to talk about that. One piece of equipment is installed in the next town over and possibly in a different state. And what do you do? You need to um, uh, you know, work with that. So this is what we uh, got to do thanks to um, uh, the trust we build with this uh, particular SCADA vendor. So, uh, just a little bit of an introduction, since uh, uh, I, I did not quite understand what control networks uh, looked like. Um, so, uh, the way it goes is approximately like this. First of all, uh, a power company is a company, and so it needs to have a corporate network. Moreover, power companies in the US are uh, deregulated, they trade electricity, so there are salespeople sitting there, and uh, well, uh, and there are all sorts of interesting things that go on in that network, uh, which you want to keep the hell away uh, from uh, lolcats, zombies, fishing. Uh, you want to keep that the hell away from your control network. Uh, secondly, there is a control network proper, <coughs> which. Um, you're doing good, sorry, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which um, includes things like energy management servers, uh, bo control boards, data historians, uh, where the data is collected, all sorts of state estimators that process the phase uh, uh, current voltage data that comes in from the field. Now, this looks uh, pretty close, right? But uh, those uh, substations, those sensors, can be placed uh, hundreds of miles away. And this line may be uh, basically a modem line. Um, so SCADA kind of looks like this. Can you actually see? There's supposed to be a dinosaur under the house. <laughs> well, um, uh, I told you you should have used GIMP. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine if you will. Uh, that there is indeed a dinosaur uh, right under there. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. So, um, very often people talk about substations in the cornfield. And as I Googled for such a picture, uh, I actually found this substation building. Oh, you can see the uh, electric uh, tower mast here. And it's actually located in Cornfield, Illinois. So, you bet. Um, and inside that uh, substation, you would find an old modem. 9600 is actually fast. High-speed modem. That's yes, yes. 
And uh, that goes over a least line uh, back to your nice uh, cloud of uh, control network. And these are really old modems, but reliable, you know. This dependable. Is what you want. Dependable. This is what you want to um, uh, depend on if you care about keeping the lights on. So all of these uh, lines come in into a modem bank. Oh, the screen is really dark. This is too bad. Uh, you would be able to see uh, the little modems. There's there. a bunch of modems where, that, where it's black. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all of those modems are driven by uh, a, com a specialized computer, which is basically not so very specialized. It's x86 uh, running Windows uh, or Linux uh, nowadays. That machine is called a front-end processor, or FED. Yeah, and, and one of the things that, one of the words I really got freaked out about when I first started at the utility was modem. They're always throwing this word around. We have all these modem connections. And from my mind, from, you know, growing up in the 80s and being a hacker back then, modem was like woody time. And I'm like, what are we doing with all these modems? But they're not actually modems. They use the, what, from my telecom background, I would use uh, CSU, DSU. Uh, these are these are nailed up four wire circuits. They're they're closed circuits. They're not modem circuits. It's not like all of these substations have telephone lines that you can dial to access the front end from the other side or or the actual substation. These are all nailed up uh, lines on just the plain old telephone network. But imagine my surprise when uh, Dartmouth, to my great regret, uh, got rid of its modem banks. And here I come to this utility, and I encounter a guy who is running a word dialing operation, <laughs> a major word dialing operation. OK. So uh, and from here on, it gets a lot more, uh, more and more fancy, more and more modern. Uh, a front-end processor, or several of them, uh, might talk to a, uh, will talk to an energy management server. Uh, this sort of a machine, again, uh, would be uh, your commodity machine, rack mountable running state estimator software and other specialized uh, state of the health of the power grid uh, software that uh, tries to solve a whole bunch of differential equations. Uh, that, um, in turn, talks to the uh, large boards where the actual operators uh, can uh, control the electric grid. And you see that these communications are all switches, but in fact, they're very likely to be over routers, and the control room may be in a completely different physical location. So the system like that is extremely expensive to build. For individual units, we're talking 100K, and that's an understatement. For an entire system, <clears throat> even for a small one. And then, you know, before our adventure started, one of the things that was uh, when I came into the utility business and, and uh, got involved in a lot of compliance work, they were always thrown around trust but verify. So I came up with a really cool idea. I've got millions of dollars worth of SCADA gear. Uh, I'm going to do some trust but verify, and I'm going to bring in researchers to have them look at this gear and tell me, um, you know, what's going on under the hood here? Because And then people like Sergio were like, whoa, that's going to be awesome. And uh, he... He's totally getting into this. He's like, um, he thinks he's in heaven. It was Christmas for, for Sergey. And um, so, um, and one of the things I really wanted to get involved in doing about this was because I'm a paranoid person. And um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, validate some of the mitigating controls that we were using on the control network. Uh, because we did a lot of freaky things that, uh, may seem a little draconian to normal uh, users of a Windows network system on the control network. In fact, uh, this was one of the most paranoid networks I've seen, although uh, I hear that um, not all utilities are that way, unfortunately. But this is the kind of a paranoia that, on, on your behalf that you get to really appreciate. But anyhow, uh, uh, what really surprised me is that was that uh, Utilities may spend a whole lot on mitigation of issues with that equipment as on the original equipment. So you can imagine, if the original things cost upward of a million dollars, then what are the maintenance um, uh, costs? So 
we could not, of course, mess with the network uh, that keeps the lights on. In, uh, that's, and th that's not a good idea or, or recommended at home. You, you probably should never fuzz an actual live production network. So <laughs> instead, um, what happened was uh, a number of uh, devices were uh, taken into this attest environment that connected them into an isolated uh, network topology, uh, isolated from the cutoff from the production network. But what we had right was the geographic distance. So when I'm talking about fuzzing across state lines, I'm not joking. Uh, the fuzzer was in... This is a sample. This is not the actual cities involved in the experiment. Sergey wanted to put a little map up, so I'm going to be going to, I mean, Champagne, so this is kind of like the idea. The whole idea behind was we have an insider who knows a lot of shit, and that was like Sergey's job, and I'm like, well, what we're going to do is give Sergey an Ethernet port inside this network we build for him that is, that is uh, it's a representative network exactly like what you would see in a control system environment. And then we did some funky stuff with VLANs and things like that so that he could do his research across a wide area network. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are actually, um, these are actually uh, affiliated, excuse me, affiliated organizations such as the University of Urbana-Champaign uh, and there is a power co-op in Springfield, but um, yeah, not the actual location. Sorry, I can't disclose that. Um, so what you want to do uh, to test the brittleness of the system uh, is, uh, well, of course, a whole bunch of uh, things. But uh, the easiest thing to do, and the thing we did uh, was, of course, uh, fuzzing. So fuzzing is uh, uh, not uh, in need of explaining, but I thought I'd just uh, um, yeah, illustrate uh, the general principle. You craft inputs and, um, and yeah, fuzzing SCADA is um, just about as hard as toppling um, intricate structures like that uh, once you get uh, to the actual equipment, to the actual network port. And uh, moreover, uh, people have been doing that. Uh, but again, uh, so for example, Ganesh Devarajan gave a talk that made a quite a bit of a splash um, in, uh, at, at Black Hat 7. Uh, the media ran with it, but the media runs with everything. Um, he uh, wrote a DNP3, a popular control protocol uh, module for Sully the Fuzzer. A digital Bond uh, did uh, an ICCP um, test, fuzzing test suite. Uh, this is what uh, you would have utilities communicate between themselves, and they release it to uh, vetted asset owners, that is to say SCADA operators. Um, there were some free releases that targeted parsers for the DNP3 protocol inside Wireshark. As you can imagine, the same protocol uh, would need to be parsed by uh, an actual target device. Uh, Mu Security makes uh, a great uh, um, uh, business uh, selling the hardware appliance. You know, your, your SCADA device uh, Ethernet goes here and uh, it talks to it and uh, you pay on the basis of uh, protocol modules that you want to test. So all of those things, though, operate for specific protocols. DNP3, um, uh, uh, Modbus, uh, 61850 family of protocols. Uh, what we needed, GOOS, uh, what we had to, to deal with is proprietary protocols. So we were not going to be told uh, which protocols were running on that SCADA network. And uh, even though I knew a sort of uh, a manual existed, and I was shown it from the distance, <laughs> with, with uh, Edmund having to hold on to it, uh, I could not see that. So we could not bring uh, the best uh, possible approach in fuzzing, that is to say, uh, fuzzing uh, based on the protocol uh, model uh, with modules uh, as uh, of, of the kind of spike. Moreover, the thing about fuzzing, is fuzzing for exploitation, is that you get to instrument the target and actually you have to spend quite a bit of work um, making sure the target restarts and enters the right kind of a communication so that you can feed uh, your crafted input 
in it. So who's going to let us instrument uh, an equipment, a piece of equipment that uh, costs uh, a whole lot and that you can't uh, waste, uh, that you can't void a warranty on? And who is going to restart it for us in the next town over across the state line uh, when uh, it crashed? And so apparently we have a problem. But in fact, we don't have a problem. And I, I can't do a convincing uh, King Leonidas impression, but this is SCADA, right? This is different. This is a different world as we found out. So first of all, you can learn what the protocol data structures look like because they are transmitted continually. That thing in the substation that's talking to the energy management server, the energy management server talking to uh, a control station uh, or the board, they are sending the same thing over and over and over again. And that data is very similar. Moreover, if you manage to crash it, a watchdog will automatically restart the control process or reboot the system if you manage to crash the system. So this is great. This is taken care of. Moreover, those things uh, keep um, uh, sending messages keep lives or status, so you can actually see when you succeeded in crashing one because these things stop and there are uh, TCP resets or Synax or uh, other uh, um, indications of attempts to restart the connection by the watchdog. So it gets better because quite a lot of those, quite a few of those protocols have this distinct handshake that establishes the data session and then lets the data flow uh, in the connection. So you can wait until that happens. And if you can get in the communication, which uh, you do, by the way, of any given a man in the middle attack, then you fuzz the data. Then you're getting at the insides of uh, the business logic of those things. And uh, it's actually pretty much similar data. So if you're doing mutational fuzzing, you have pretty good coverage because the same piece of data will be crossing the network pretty often, and you can mutate it differently. So for mutational fuzzing, this really, really helps. And so uh, the standard approach that people take to mutational fuzzing is probably exemplified by GPF, the general purpose fuzzer, uh, VDA labs, it's uh, open. What it does is it saves network protocol sessions. So you've got the PCAP file, nice packet capture, and then you replay it using heuristics uh, for inserting uh, large runs of ASCII characters or large runs of unbalanced, uh, 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 what do you call those things, parentheses, you call them delimiters, yes. And uh, then you observe the target and see if it crashes. That wasn't quite what we needed to do. Or we could not actually, we did not actually want to save those sessions. In fact, we will probably would not be able to, and I would not be able to walk out of there with um, packet captures in my pocket. So uh, what we needed, and what we needed to do additionally, was bring back some of the spikiness, uh, the approach that David Itell um, first discovered. Uh, spike uh, is, his, uh, is just about the first a block-based fuzzer, you start uh, with a model of a protocol and uh, you generate it block by block, field by field, uh, and you uh, mutate those fields, you fuzz <coughs> those fields um, uh, heuristically based on what is likely to crash uh, the recipient. So you do that to get past the first sanitization stage, uh, past the first uh, sanity check of um, your target to get to the business logic. So what we wanted to do was first fuzz data in transit with something like GPF, but guess blocks of the unknown protocol. Just, just enough uh, to uh, do better. And um, there was a little scientific idea or a dirty hack, depending on how you look at it, uh, that, that occurred to us. Uh, it was there is a thing that counts repetitive tokens, repetitive substrings in communications. And it does so in order to compress 
files. And Lempel and Ziv uh, came up with that um, quite a long time ago, the fathers of uh, modern practical compression, you might say. So we run a variant of this algorithm. We don't compress anything, but we accumulate the same string table. So, and we seed it with uh, an initial set of packet captures. And then to those repeated strings, we assume they are tokens, uh, we apply uh, the heuristics. And so uh, architecturally, it looks uh, pretty simple. Here is your IPQ. Uh, here is your uh, men in the middle attack. Uh, we found that our poisoning uh, generally worked, which was a bit of a surprise. Of course, in order for us to get there, uh, a whole other layer of security that included IPsec had to be rolled back. But uh, an interesting observation was layer two security is too expensive. So the things that you do, uh, they would get in the way of rec quickly recovering the network under you know, the circumstances that you would want to um, recover it under if the lights are out. So, uh, but there are other mutants, of course. Once we have the packets flowing through us, and of course, one of those mittens uh, uh, was against the gateway so that we could see the target the next town over. Uh, they are handed to IPQ. Through IPQ, uh, they were given to a Linux user land uh, per packet uh, uh, tokenizer that I just described. Through that, they were fed to a modified GPF so that it could deal with packets on the packet level rather than with uh, uh, sessions. And uh, so it worked. So as a recap of the technical issues, <clears throat> what was really needed was looking for signs of the target crashing and backing off so that the connection could become reestablished by the ever so watchful watchdogs and by the ever so helpful uh, modules that restarted those connections on the servers and uh, um, front ends. So, we have a whole bunch of rules. The simplest involve looking for resets. Well, obviously, you crash the process, so uh, your further TCP traffic to that port is going to be rejected. Repeated sins, uh, special auth handshakes, and those uh, regexps were not allowed to release, obviously, um, because uh, the um, uh, vendor insisted on the protocol becoming as closed as possible. And timeouts. So with that, you can actually get pretty good coverage of most standard protocols. Uh, because if you uh, are sure you crash the target, you just move the window of fuzzing and you proceed. And so, you know, it's not the uh, smarter uh, ways uh, that people fuzz for vulnerabilities, but it gets pretty good coverage. Uh, one problem is that you must find the checksums and recompute them. And you can do that with uh, a bunch of other tricks. So in the end, uh, the uh, more developed version of the fuzzer that we're working on now, and have almost done, uh, includes uh, things like fixing uh, TCP sequences uh, when you um, uh, insert, inject uh, extra TCP packets uh, to accommodate the longer fuzzed payloads. Uh, then there are custom rules uh, that um, identify uh, replies and identify uh, the um, authentication <coughs> sessions, and then um, uh, there is a tokenizer and mutator. Okay? So how does that do? It's a bunch of heuristics, right? Well, we could obviously not instrument uh, SCADA, a gear, but we instrumented a couple of things, uh, a streaming protocol and an IM protocol, thinking that they might be roughly uh, about the same things. So uh, DApp uh, used by iTunes and uh, Oscar used by uh, Game, Aim, uh, instant messaging. And so you see, this is what you get. This is the cover, code coverage, which we could instrument, of course. Uh, this is what you get with random fuzzing, random mutational fuzzing. This is what you get with GPF um, unchanged, out of the box. Uh, this is what you get 
with uh, um, our lazy fuzzer. No, wait. Uh, this is what you get with our lazy fuzzer. There, I'm colorblind. Um, so, and this is, uh, uh, this is all of the code running uh, in on the fuzzed uh, stage. Uh, with game, we were under fuzzing, but probably uh, actually not under fuzzing. Uh, the problem was that uh, as uh, we restarted um, the, uh, the sessions, uh, we could not exactly replicate what the sessions were. But basically, you know, we did better than uh, the GPF, which was, and much better than random, which was good. So we <coughs> validated our methodology, which was the only phrase I was allowed to say about the whole engagement uh, for and a while. And Sergey really touched on it just a little bit in, uh, when he was going through the actual fuzzing part of this, but one of the other things that Sergey really had to struggle through was the weight and, and the measurements that we were taking when we were determining how long it would take him to be successful with all the mitigating controls turned on, which uh, Sergey was not able to successfully fuzz the network with the mitigating controls turned on. Well, uh, I did not have the IPsec key, and I was not allowed to exploit anything that was connected to the network. So, well, um, he had a, he had a few uh, stumbling blocks, and you know he had some handcuffs on. But one of the things we really wanted to do was was check and show that the mitigating controls that we use to prevent uh, bad things from happening on the network, because one of the things we're very concerned about is the insider threat and the USBs of the world and people bringing in stuff and plugging it into Ethernet ports that we may not be able to control underneath someone's desk inside a closed room. And uh, it was nice to have the paranoia justified because when we do turn back the mitigating controls and, and lift open uh, the door a little bit for someone like Sergey to come in and, uh, and fuzz, there was a lot of people uh, concerned about their careers if we ever uh, did do a, a full disclosure on what we found. Well, so as, as, uh, as you realize, right, this is uh, not uh, about fuzzing per se. This is about being able to inject into the network, right? Um, and of course, uh, fuzzing is only a stand-in for real exploitation uh, that is enabled by injection. So uh, mitigating controls, isolation, uh, has all the reasons to be paranoid. And then it was really good for us because Sergey got a chance to validate his science at the same time from a corporate perspective. We got a chance to uh, better communicate an understanding of why certain mitigating controls existed on this network because they're very cumbersome to uh, people who don't understand why this is so important. Uh, so um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was very successful on, on both the business side of the fence and on the scientific side of the fence. And then it's been a few, it's been a while since it's happened. And, and one of the things that as this, this has been in the past and we did the research and, and nothing ever came out from it, um, it's, it's really a success story about how um, academia and, and uh, industry can work together and an academic can get his papers published and uh, not necessarily interfere with uh, the reputation of any businesses that may or may not have been involved in this uh, so research. You we, know, we tried zero we, and 50 states. Yeah, we tried to walk a fine line uh, and, um, you know, hopefully we'll be coming back. So. Mm -hmm. uh, one really good question is, what is the role of full disclosure in this? Uh, SCADA, arguably, changes as an application, changes the game for full disclosure quite a bit. Uh, the idea being that, well, you do not find SCADA devices in the hands of the general public. It's not your iPhone. If you publish a SCADA advisory, it's kind of hard to make the argument that SCADA exploit. It's kind of hard to make the argument that you are uh, somehow exposing the um, naive uh, and the uh, uh, guiltless uh, common user who uh, cannot be expected to take um, protective steps uh, to a paranoid level. Your SCADA should be run by people who are professionally paranoid. Uh, your vendors, on the other hand, would not appreciate it at all. 
Uh, and even though uh, big power companies buy a lot of gear from them, and so as big customers they have a considerable pool, it's really not as easy to get a vendor to release a patch. Uh, maybe a war story? Well, it's not that. The, the whole idea behind patching in these types of systems is, is multiple. First, you have to get the vendor to develop the patch, and they have to go through their own QA process before the patch is ready to go. And then the vendor really needs to make a decision about whether or not they're going to let the patch be released. And then even after that point, as a utility or a, a you know, keeper of critical infrastructure, you need to decide when it's going to be a good time to install the patch. And then one of the things you always weigh when you're deciding about whether or not you're going to patch is, is uh, what other mitigating or compensating controls do you have to, uh, to possibly delay the ins installation of the patch. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of complex things involved. When you have a system that always needs to stay on, how do you patch something like that? It's not like every Tuesday we can turn off the electric grid for for two hours so we can reboot all the systems. So, so I was happy to give the ammunition that uh, uh, Edmund needed to talk to a particular vendor who has been recalcitrant on those things. Now, the vendor, um, now, I was not allowed to take back the crash dumps, but the vendor was phoned and, and uh, um, informed of this thing that was suspe suspected to be uh, quite brittle, uh, remaining brittle after a number of patches. Uh, the next day, uh, a vendor representative came in from thousands of miles away. And, and they had to be in by 7 a.m. too. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and we were in the room, and they were basically doing the vendor response of calming things down, you know, trying to talk this uh, uh, down, and uh, I was uh, enjoying the uh, the proceedings, I must say. So, hmm. They had good cheese. Uh, uh, they had good well, cheese. <laughs> I didn't get any of it. If I did, I deny it. They wouldn't let I Sergei wouldn't be keep able to. I wouldn't be able they, to. They take wouldn't let Sergey keep the cheese. Yeah. Remember the man trap? They took the cheese home with them. Yeah. That thing is real. I, you know, it was a weird, a weird experience coming through that thing to get to a network port. But hey, so uh, let's look into the future. Uh, the future is going to be this wonderful, uh, much uh, more. Um, uh, reliable, agile, smarter uh, grid, um, maybe. Or maybe it's going to be this long struggle through uh, p political visions of the bright future, uh, but the way is um, all strewn with rakes and, uh, well, um, surprises. <laughs> or maybe, maybe, as we get uh, progressively uh, more dark and paranoid in our outlook, uh, maybe uh, some really bad things would happen, right? The way we normally do engineering is by putting things together, composing things, but some compositions are deadly. In fact, the greatest uh, wisdom about security from the academic point of view is security is not composable. If you forget anything that uh, came, ever came out of the academic science, uh, remember this. Um, complexity kills, as Anna likes saying, and I really like that uh, quote too. <coughs> so, and of course there are wrong threat models. You know, what is going to get you? Um, uh, this thing is supposed to be real. Right, so here is your corral, here, is, here are your horses, and this thing comes out of the blue. Apparently, such things were real in South America, and there are fossils to prove that. So, um, uh, what's, that, what's that word, Rodrigo? Um, the word you taught me yesterday. Joselito. Joselito, yes. <laughs> Anyhow, now, uh, with all the hype about the smart grid and every bit of, every bit of media, every two-bit journalist 
uh, writing up a storm about how it is going to improve life and solve all of our energy dependence problems and uh, somehow improve the climate a hundred years into the future. Um, you have, uh, it, when you, you know you talk to a power guy, when he says it's a smarter grid, thank you very much, the grid is already pretty smart. It has a whole bunch of sensors, it has a whole bunch of other uh, software and hardware pieces that uh, take advantage of those sensors, but uh, it is going to get larger as meters and phasers are going to be rolled out through the actual power grid. In fact, the biggest money may not be in uh, smart meters. It might be in all sorts of sensors. Uh, figures being um, discussed are tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but it's clearly going to be a lot. Uh, a whole bunch of vendors are very keen on uh, replacing the car and controlling elements of the smart grid, like relays, with what they call intelligence electronic devices, all rolled together in various um, uh, uh, compositional ways. And uh, so you uh, have this problem. How do you secure a hundred millions of devices? And it's really a to be or not to be question. The first issue that looms once you step out of an academic setting uh, and uh, talk to people who run networks uh, in the world is how do you remotely administrate and whether you can actually afford to remotely administrate all of those things. Then the network environment is almost certainly going to be the internet. Uh, Arduinos now make uh, toilets uh, tweet and uh, you can not find any class of a household appliance that has not been connected by uh, one way or another uh, to the internet by way of uh, a radio. But do you trust that environment to carry your packets? How do you trust the identities in that environment? And will the solutions like uh, authenticating solutions scale up to that scale? Trust is the primary issue in uh, the grand plans of smart grid deployments. How do you extend trust to hundreds of millions of devices or you know, in a particular deployment, even if it's a million for a big utility? If you can't trust them, what good are they? How do you keep all of them trustworthy? We talked to an operator of a large electric utility and they realized that they, they could not pay for the bandwidth from uh, a big ISP because the ISP reasonably, quite reasonably as it turned out, wanted peak rates and huge bandwidth and a latency uh, and fees for keeping the latency low enough uh, to make this a reasonable uh, SCADA control environment. So uh, they realized that they would have to build their own network. They could not afford uh, the structure of those fees. Whenever you scale um, any kind of solution that you find in a more modern world, like where I worked at, um, we had uh, a smart meter solution basically where the, the meter had a cell phone tied to it and it would phone in usage data. So we have a million meters out here that do this. When there's an outage, what happens when a million cell phones make a phone call at the same time? You have a massive denial of service attack on the phone network, so your carrier gets all mad at you because this happens, so you really don't get a lot of the data in a timely manner when you need it when you have all these devices. It, it, it presents a lot of interesting problems about you almost have too much data at, to get it in a timely manner. How, how do we extend trust, get data where we need it from in a timely manner so that we can make decisions? Moreover, uh, ISPs, tend to believe that if you buy more bandwidth for the, from them, it will also improve your latency. Now, your latency doesn't matter that much if you're doing what their customers mostly do, which is uh, download, uh, watch uh, video, play games. Games are actually tricky. So uh, my wife, who is uh, um, a maintainer of uh, Crawdad and an avid game player, Anya, uh, wave. Um, uh, is my latency um, sensor. 
uh, the moment uh, something, is something interesting is happening on the network, despite the bandwidth being just great, she detects it uh, when she's playing. So, uh, ISPs may not be able to continue solving latency problems, latency requirements of SCADA by just doing what they usually do, throw more bandwidth at it. Of course, uh, I love referring to this uh, Den Gear uh, address at uh, Source Boston. Uh, and this kind of like talks to what I was just talking about before. You know, we've got a one, basically right now, a one-way network out to our, to the home meter. You know, what happens, and then what are you really buying if you can get remote administration or you can push data out to the meter uh, when, you, when you get 80% uh, of the information you already need from a one-way communication out from the home. Uh, so when you start getting to a situation where the, the meters are remotely accessible, then you've got uh, interesting ideas about people who can actually update firmware on those devices because they're able to accept data coming in. And it's an evolutionary argument. Organisms either adapt to changes in environment, mm -hmm. that is to say their firmware gets upgraded, or they die. And then there's a more practical problem about, you know. Um, how do you uh, commission them? How do you put them in place? How you do know? you maintain trust? I mean, how do you trust 100 million devices? Um, well, one way is, of course, cryptography. It uh, is said that, um, you know, we're pretty good at uh, using key-based cryptography to authenticate things, except maybe not 100 million things at a time. So authenticating things requires sharing a secret or uh, a key, at least, with uh, every device in the environment. Mm -hmm. And just exactly how do you do that? If this is a humanly, if this is a human-bound operation, uh, then it costs a whole lot of money. If it is a remote, automated operation, you have a huge attack surface. So, a really interesting observation that came to us from another uh, utility operator has been that they found they went the way of PKI for authenticating their devices. They found that at a certain scale, the keys, the ephemeral bit strings that go on those devices cost them more than the physical devices themselves with all the electronics and all the kit and caboodle. So, uh, and that was not a uh, very successful PKI deployment for them. Managing this shitload of keys means uh, being able to replace them when people lose them, being able to revoke them, being able to support the owners who can't get to uh, do what they want to do. So this is a huge problem, and I posit that it is not entirely solved. One reason why securing that, those kinds of network is hard is that you want to protect the link layer communication. In fact, the 61850 popular SCADA protocols are originally designed for layer two, broadcast medium, multicast medium. Now, in order to secure layer two, you need to get keys onto uh, devices. You need to engage them in cryptographic protocols. Implementing cryptographic protocols in layer two without sockets is uh, not a pleasant uh, thing to deal with. So programming with frames sucks. Programming with sockets is just about how the internet happened, how most protocols are um, implemented, how developers are trained. You need a whole bunch of developers. So there is this crypto chicken and egg problem. If, all, if you need layer three to distribute keys and uh, run an authentication protocol, you know, you, should, you, you have to do it before you've secured layer two, right? So what gives you that layer three? Layer two has alre already has to be under it. So it is uh, a chicken uh, and egg. And finally, uh, you want to uh, keep, um, you know, here's your, there's, there was your C in confidentiality. How about integrity in the 
um, famous uh, CIA uh, triple. How much is it in terms of energy cost to maintain 100 million computers doing whatever computation they need to do in order to uh, check their own integrity? I mean, your power meters are running. Uh, that CPU cost is not free. Uh, pushing patches to those, you need some really fat pipes. And finally, uh, if you want to go the, right, uh, the, the way of TPMs, so here is the march of TPMs, Trusted Computing Group, right? Uh, that is uh, probably so far the best that the uh, hardware industry can offer uh, in commodity devices. But how do you maintain a white list of trusted configurations? How quickly does that blow up? It's a really good question if we uh, have the engineering ways to address those problems yet, if we still understand them. Or maybe we'll have to discover them, let's hope we'll, we will not have to discover them in the traditional way of stepping on them and going. Yep, it hit us again. So thank you for your attention, uh, and while we still <coughs> have uh, less than three minutes. <laughs> We'll take your question. So sorry for the non-disclosure and no vendor blame, uh, but uh, I want to come back there. I became sort of attached to that man trap. <laughs> Sergey, big easy. Thank you very much. Um, questions? So Sergey, did you manage to uh, trip any switches and turn off things you shouldn't do? Um. <laughs> Uh, so part of the, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> easy, let us have a beer. <laughs> you get a um, piece of cheese for that. There you go, yeah. Um, uh, part of the reason, I mean, um, we spent, once we got our mitten, and once we uh, had uh, a reasonable degree of control over the topology, uh, we spent, um, this was the only loud thing that we did. We spent the next hour listening and trying to understand who was talking to whom. Uh, and um, what protocols were in use and what that, uh, uh, what that meant, and what other front ends might have been there, what other uh, energy server, uh, energy management servers were there. It's, um, it was an isolated environment, but it was a big environment. You know, and, we, and we said that it's all about defense and depth and how deep the hole goes. When you're there and you're in between and you're, you make it to the middle, these are not very mature, maturely coded systems. So you can imagine what you could do if, uh, if you were so inclined. But uh, it was a fun exercise. Uh, you know, basically, uh, we had a phone line with... Um, was it a phone line, or did we have uh, did, did did they have a remote uh, access to that machine as well? Uh, you remember when we um, when when I would uh, try to uh, switch a different fuzzing mode, mm -hmm. and that person would say, ah, you know, yeah, uh, that, another had, another crash. We had console another crash. console access. Right here comes the blue screen to the uh, machines. Yep. So. Um, you know, it was an interesting experience. And of course, you only want to crash the things that people want you to crash. Uh, if uh, it's a trip next over, if it's a drive to the next town for them, uh, to reset that, uh, that thing. Or and and the more interesting things don't really result in crashes in the first place, because if your control system crashes, it's going to be noticeable. So, uh, but uh, it And the lights don't go out when the control system crashes. Yeah. The lights stay on. The, the power grid is more resilient than, than, uh, than that. Yeah, this is actually one of the major media miscommunications that uh, they need to be called on their bullshit. Uh, the power grid was built before computers, strictly speaking, and it has ways, uh, electromechanical ways of protecting itself and uh, of uh, running itself if and the more controlled, uh, if, if more control involved in trading or 
uh, fair final load distribution you is can, not available. You can close breakers, you can shut things down from these systems, but these systems are not necessarily required for the, for the grid to operate. It can be done without these systems. It would be a really bad thing uh, if, they did, if they hadn't. But it would be like Marty McFlyin back to the future. He'd be going back to the 50s without a cool DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> Just what you Sorry. said, I mean, if you go ahead and, and scale the system itself to the scale you want to have with um, renewable energy power and things like that, then suddenly you're probably relying on those SCADA systems all the time, aren't you? Um, yes, and it's a, a good comparison is probably flying by wire. A modern aircraft... Uh, at some point uh, reach the uh, more mili performance aircraft, military aircraft. And, and some of the more challenging things along those lines are, are thinking about uh, all of the stuff that's coming onto the grid that, that can produce electricity, but not in very large amounts. People think about one megawatt as being a lot of electricity, but really isn't on the grand scale of uh, a grid as big as maybe the Eastern Interconnect in the United States. But if you've got thousands or hundreds of thousands of different little small solar arrays or wind farms, you don't know where this electricity is going to come from, you need a lot more information uh, in a short amount of time because these systems need to solve the, 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 the state of the system. They do this every six seconds. And then we're, it needs to get more and more data in. And then there's some more sophisticated data that's also involved. And then, at least in the United States, there's also regulatory uh, requirements that if you if you make real-time decisions based on information that you receive from the field then there could be certain regulations that then apply to these systems which are very costly um, so there's a lot of you know compliance and business issues with the emergence of all this uh, routable data that's coming in from the field so the uh, you know just like I said uh, if your plane that's fly-by-wire that cannot be flown by a human uh, because of its uh, uh, aerodynamic instability that makes it so agile in the first place. Uh, if the wire goes, well, the plane goes. Uh, so, you know, God forbid we get cars that are drive-by-wire, right? Uh, my, my truck has uh, seven computers in it, and I'm not enjoying uh, that thought. Not at all. No. The cheese for you. Uh, I think last question. Yep. Uh, so, from your cousin, you know uh, exactly what values were causing the crash, or did you only know uh, approximately? Oh. And were yes. you allowed to follow up on that? Uh, were you given the information or access to, to determine what the problems were so that you have a good uh, picture of what the actual problems of these systems are? Um, yes. Yes, but, but but you can just talk about it. That's it. Uh, vendors, vendors have been vendor has been given full report with specific uh, packet captures that their systems barfed on. So. so, so that means anybody who has written something like Stuxnet is an insider, right? I mean, even um, you didn't get the information. Uh, people who wrote Stuxnet, I mean, look. Uh, um, Compared to the complexity of Stuxnet, our little fuzzer is, you know, uh, it, it's not, it, it's, it's uh, decidedly kindergarten, right? So, yeah, people The people who, who wrote Stuxnet had access to the manual that we didn't have when we did this experiment. <laughs> <laughs> is that a they good way to access, answer the question, Sergey? Yeah, they had the access to the damn centrifuges, most likely. <laughs> okay, so some more rumors were born about Stuxnet. Uh, yeah, no, no, no Stuxnet. <laughs> no Stuxnet. We, are, no, no we, Stuxnet. we said no Stuxnet <laughs> no in the Stuxnet. talk. We're not here to confirm or deny anything about Stuxnet. Yeah, no Stuxnet. I think you can refer again to the yeah. situation. Yeah. Yes, okay. uh, but do, do watch, uh, do watch uh, those two talks at uh, the uh, Chaos Communications Congress. In particular, uh, they covered both sides of Stuxnet, both wonderful pieces of engineering that went there. One, the Windows uh, four zero days that that um, uh, were so well engineered and so cross system uh, that is just amazing. Uh, that's a guy from Microsoft. That's the first talk. Uh, the second talk is by Felix Lindner, FS, FX. Uh, he wrote his custom disassembler for the PLC code. Um, and um, in the process discovered some things about, uh, about the PLCs that the Stuxnet designers themselves might have missed. So this is a fascinating talk. 
which led him uh, and other people uh, to believe that uh, the authors of Stuxnet might have actually been using the Siemens SDK uh, oh, as opposed to their uh, homegrown SDK. On okay, the other hand, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, I have to hurry up a little bit because um, we will continue at 4 p.m. Um, if you have more questions, um, feel free um, to talk to Sergey in Big Easy. I don't know if they have some cheese left, but um, I am cheese, sure they will also take cheese, questions. Cheese, forget cheese, beer. Okay, beer. Right, right, beer does it. <laughs> <laughs>